Awesome. So we have some people coming in now, Tim. Um, if you want to start with a little introduction, you can do that and then we'll take it away from there. Yeah, no, that sounds great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today on this uh, rainy day. I'm not sure what it's like over in PEI, but uh, over here in Nova Scotia, it is a rainy one today. So uh, hopefully it'll be sunny tomorrow. We're not too sure. I guess we, um, we've got a good session coming up today. So thanks for, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Hopefully you all get some good value out of this. I know we have a few people that, uh, that are going to be joining us. So I want to just give you a bit of a background um, as to what we're going to be uh, looking at today. So I'm hoping to give you some information on how you can grow your business in a cost-effective way uh, by taking on some work-term students. Um, I've got a, uh, an interesting example of, of a company that, uh, that was very successful in using this strategy. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that, and then we'll get into the, uh, the details of the, uh, the subsidies that are available in PEI, both through the province and then also through uh, ICTC, the organization that I work with. All right. So one of the advantages, of course, of uh, taking on a work term student is that you really do get a chance to um, to really know the person that you're uh, that you're taking on. Uh, often, I've seen companies uh, use this as a great uh, a great way to I call it test driving a student just to see if that person is going to be a good fit for your organization. It's also a great way to make a connection with uh, potential future employees. Uh, and then when you do offer them a, a position, if that makes sense, then you already know that they will be a good fit because they've been working in your organization for quite some time. So that works out really well for, for many people. So let's, uh, let's jump into this um, just very briefly. And I promise there is only one slide on, on who we are and what we do. Um, but the bottom line is that we've been around for quite a while as an organization. And uh, we were originally a sector council back in, uh, back in the 90s became a not-for-profit uh, in the mid-2000s. And we still do many of the things we did back then, um, which is to provide uh, research and insights into the technology uh, arena for uh, governments. Um, we also use that to help us drive our, uh, what we call our capacity building programs. And so this, this work integrated learning program is, is one of those capacity building programs and the goal is to uh, help us create a, a larger digital talent pool so that uh, folks that need to grow their businesses, uh, particularly with technical talent, uh, have a good talent pool to do that, to do that with. So as I mentioned, I have an interesting story I wanted to um, just to share with you. And I think it helps put this whole uh, program into perspective. So I came across um, the uh, the CEO and, and co-founder of Open Ocean Robotics uh, when I was on a webinar a little while back and I reached out to her and, and she told me her story, but it's, it's very interesting. Um, late in 2018, uh, Judy Angus and, and her partner Colin, they, they had this idea, they wanted to create these um, autonomous ocean vehicles. And uh, so they were originally, they were working out of uh, Julie's garage, as many startups are. And uh, they got to a point where they had a lot of good expertise in certain areas, but they needed some help on the electrical engineering side. And so Julie, uh, of course, they were a pre-revenue company. They didn't have a lot of funds to, uh, to work with. So in order to uh, be able to get over this hump that they had, uh, they decided to look at the option of bringing on a couple of co-op uh, students. They happened to be out on the West Coast. Uh, and so they turned to the University of Victoria uh, and the electrical engineering co-op program there. And they actually took on a couple of work term students uh, to um, help them get through this electrical engineering problem that they were having. So in May of 2019, uh, Julie applied for some funding through our organization, through ICTC, uh, to help keep the costs down for bringing on these work term students into their organization. And uh, so they ended up bringing two students on. And uh, then having demonstrated that those students were really useful and, and uh, helped them get through uh, some challenging uh, design uh, problems, then they actually uh, applied for funding for three more students in July and August of 2019. Um, and they currently have, uh, they've got one application that's uh, just about to be finalized uh, this year. But as you can see, uh, they ended up being pretty successful. And a lot of that was due to the students that they had taken on board. And what you'll be interested to know is that this is actually just a, a screen snip from their website. 
And there are a couple of people on here that were uh, either our students or were former students. And I'll just, uh, just highlight. So this gentleman here, uh, he was actually one of the work term students that they brought on and then eventually offered a full-time position to. And as I said, they really knew that, uh, that this gentleman, Matthew, was going to be a great fit for their organization because he had been helping them to, uh, to design their vehicle right from the get-go. And then this other gentleman here, you can see that he's still currently an electrical engineering undergrad, but uh, chances are that he'll be offered a full-time role, as I understand it, after speaking with Judy once he graduates. So the reason I wanted to just to talk about um, that organization really is just to, just to highlight the fact that this is a really great way of bringing in some skills from, uh, from university students to help businesses get over whatever hump that they happen to be in or, or to grow their business or to add some value in, in different areas. So I talked about it being a cost-effective way of doing it. So let me just put this screen up here. Now this is what would happen, the, the top bar here, this is the number that if you were taking on a student um, and uh, looking at a three month work term here, just because that's what we're faced with under the current conditions, but at $20 an hour, that's maybe a little rich. I think 17 to 19 is, is a more typical uh, uh, salary that you would be paying a, a, a technology student um, in PEI, but you know, $20 an hour is a nice round number to work with. So you'd be looking at a, um, a work term cost of about $9,600. Now the province, um, PEI have a very, very good, uh, and some of you may be aware of it, a very good plan uh, to help defer and offset some of those costs. Uh, and for a for-profit business, uh, they would actually cover, as I understand it, uh, about 75% of the overall cost. So with the provincial program, you go from $9,600 down to about a $2,400 price tag. But for early stage companies, or even particularly today when companies uh, perhaps are having some cash flow challenges, uh, wouldn't it be nice if you could further reduce that number from 2,400 right down to, to zero? And so with no subsidy, um, it's a fairly high price tag. The provincial subsidy brings you down quite significantly. And then with uh, ICTC's work integrated learning um, subsidy, then that, that can bring it down to zero, which I think is, you know, it doesn't really get much better than that um, in terms of the, uh, the cost for bringing in some skilled talent into your, into your business. So breaking this down just a little bit, so as I said, the, um, the post-secondary student program, in, that's what the program is called in PEI, and that does fund uh, quite a lot um, uh, of, the, uh, of the wages for your work-term students. And when you combine that with the, the Will Digital program, which could bring as much as $7,000 for what we would call underrepresented students, and I'll talk about that in, in a little bit, uh, you can see how that can bring the cost right down to zero pretty quickly. Um, and of course, being cost conscious at the moment, uh, hopefully by combining these pro two programs together, that we can open up some work term opportunities for students, because as you can imagine, uh, a lot of those opportunities that were out there uh, are no longer there um, due to the current conditions. So it would be great if we're able to, uh, to work together and open up some opportunities to bring students on board. So the, uh, the program in PEI, um, as I said, it, it works up to, uh, between eight and 18 weeks. I think more typically it would be 12 to 16 weeks, but um, there is some flexibility there. Um, one thing is that the student for the PEI program, uh, which I think makes sense, they need to be a PEI resident. So, and that's fine. And you can check out the, um, on, on the website down here, you can check out the, uh, the details if you want to look into it a little more closely. Um, and the other thing is that, and again, th these rules are pretty, uh, th they're pretty basic, but you, um, the student could not be a relative or a family member. So, you know, if, you're, if your daughter needs a job, then you can't take them on and, uh, and pay them through that, um, that provincial subsidy. But I, I think that's, that's pretty reasonable. And then in terms of the, uh, the ICTC program, so Will Digital, that, that is our uh, wage subsidy program. And as you, can, as you can see down here in the corner, we're actually funded by the government of Canada. So it's a, it's a federally funded program. And so we're able to combine 
our program with provincial programs and some provinces um, generally do not like to have that combination it's called stacking um, and that is typically true in, in Nova Scotia in particular um, however for this summer uh, and I believe that in, in PEI that is uh, generally something which is supported by the provincial government but it is certainly supported this summer uh, I have had some discussions with uh, with the local team here but our program is, um, is quite interesting. But as I mentioned, um, we can offer up to $7,000 or 70% of salary for the underrepresented groups. And you can, you can read what they, uh, who they would be there. Um, and then for all others, we can offer a subsidy of $5,000 or 50% of salary. But again, that's, um, that's, I think, pretty decent when you can combine that with, uh, with a provincial program. But there is one, one challenge, and I know that we're certainly lobbying to, to try and change this, um, but we're currently unable to provide that funding to an international student. And I know uh, international students in, in Atlantic form quite a large percentage of the, uh, the student population and the student uh, talent. But um, the federal funder has decided at this point that that's not the, uh, the approach they want to take. We're certainly hopeful that that will change in the future. Uh, but that's, uh, that's not something we can work with at the moment. Now, the Will Digital program uh, has changed a little bit to adapt to the current reality that, that we're all facing with COVID-19. Uh, previously, uh, post-secondary institutions, they would not qualify as, uh, as an employer, but, but they do now. And that's creating some interesting opportunities around Atlantic where uh, post-secondary educational establishments uh, can uh, take on work term students and either deploy them on internal projects and get funding from us to help them do that. Uh, and I know that there are some that are looking at deploying the students in uh, outside community projects, which I, I think might be uh, an interesting opportunity as well. There has been some uh, flexibility also in allowing the students to work remotely. Previously, the goal of the Work Integrated Learning Program was to give students an opportunity to gain that workplace experience so that they would be ready to, uh, to jump into the workforce once they graduated. Um, but of course, the reality today is that, that most of those opportunities don't exist and remote placements are now allowed. So if you're thinking of taking on someone to work with you in a digital tech kind of role, then they could definitely be um, looking at doing that from a, a remote work perspective. Which, uh, which makes it, I think, a lot easier and a lot more practical. And quite honestly, I think that's going to, we're gonna see a lot more working from home, working remotely as we go forward, um, where many organizations are realizing that having everybody in the office, there are some benefits, you know, some of these serendipitous things that can happen uh, around the water cooler that can't happen when you're online. But I think learning the skills on how to collaborate and, and leverage some of the tools that are out there to work remotely, those are important skills too. So this gives students a chance to, uh, to do that. Now, something which I think is important um, from uh, many companies' perspective is that we are now able to offer a large proportion of the overall subsidy, the expected subsidy. We can give that right at the very beginning of the work term. So if companies are having some, uh, some short-term cash flow issues, then this can certainly uh, make a difference and, and alleviate that problem where in the past you'd have to wait two to three weeks after the work term completed and you submitted all your payroll records before you received your subsidy. Now we can give you three quarters of that right up front and then the balance would be when the, uh, when the, uh, the work term is completed. So hopefully that will help make it a little easier to, uh, to take on some work term students as well. So just thinking a little bit about uh, what kind of employers would be eligible to apply for our funding, and it's, it's pretty flexible. Um, the, the key is that you need to be a registered Canadian business. That's, that's, the, that, that's the largest part of it. Either a, a for-profit or a not-for-profit, we can work with uh, either types of organizations. Um, and you also need to be able to provide some sort of general liability insurance coverage so that uh, the, 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 the student employee is covered should any mishaps occur. And I, I think something else here is, is bringing the employee uh, or the student on as an employee, not, a, not as a contractor, because then they can, they can enjoy all of the benefits uh, of the um, uh, uh, 
workman's compensation and all those other things should that hopefully it wouldn't be necessary but should it be necessary as an employee they are better protected than than coming on as a contractor now the position requirements uh, ICTC is able to fund a very very wide range of uh, of roles and and goodness as you can as you can see here I mean the real requirement is is an is an IT or digital tech role which I think pretty much covers most things that uh, that company would be doing today. And you'll notice also it does suggest that, or not suggest, it does say um, that that could include a business development role or a technical sales or a digital marketing role. So, you know, as long as the, you, it's like any grant application, you kind of want to surface what are those IT or digital tech um components of the role uh that that student is going to be working with so if it was a business development role perhaps they'd be looking at some sort of data analytics to analyze the marketplace um if they're doing digital marketing of course maybe search engine optimization uh or digital uh, um google analytics something like that um, and then of course the more traditional it roles software developers solution architects that sort of thing so so a pretty wide range of, uh, of businesses. And uh, interestingly enough, we, um, we are also able to work with uh, positions that are either full-time or part-time. So if you didn't feel that you needed 40 hours a week of a student, then we can work with you on that. It doesn't have to be a full-time role, as I said. But the real key is that there is a learning opportunity for that student and then the, hence the name work integrated learning so we have to be able to demonstrate that that student is going to be able to pick up some some good useful skills in that it or digital tech uh, arena um, so that that will help them become a more hireable student when they uh, when they do actually hit the uh, hit the workforce so yeah so pretty much anything anything uh, that we do today involves digital tech but just to give you a, a couple of examples so um, if we had uh, a, a, a video game developer that needed to have a, a graphic artist perhaps come in and help them out with, uh, with some of their work. So that, that could certainly be um, a, a role that could be funded by, uh, by us. Or if you had, let's say, a, a business student that was helping to develop an export plan perhaps and coming up with some processes and procedures you know, that would that needed to be uh, put in place in order to, you know, collect information some privacy uh, uh, policies and some security policies, as long as we can surface the I, the IT or digital tech component of that, those things are all, all very valid and, and very relevant. And then from a student perspective, now I already mentioned that unfortunately, we're not able to uh, support a, an international student. But pretty much um, all others uh, would, would be fundable. So uh, they would need to be registered either full-time or part-time in a post-secondary institution. So we're not, just, we're not just working with universities. We also can work with colleges like, like Holland College, for, for example. Um, and then the other interesting thing is that we, there's no age limit to the students that we can fund. And, just this morning, I was speaking with someone out in New Brunswick, and they actually have a a 35-year-old uh, pre uh, former teacher who is reskilling in the graphic arts world, uh, and also had some web development experience, um, website development experience from the past. So we're able to, um, as a college student, an NBCC student, in, or CCNB student in this case, um, but she brings a lot of talent to the table, even though she would be a first year student. But uh, we can also work with undergrads, masters, PhD students, and, and pretty much all disciplines. I, I can't think of a discipline that we wouldn't be able to work with. And a good example I like to use is, I know up in the um, Memorial University, they actually have a masters of folklore uh, degree program and I'm thinking that we could actually if, if there was and go back to the video video game example if a video game company was uh, developing video games that were folklore based chances are we could actually bring one of those masters of folklore into a ICT type of environment a team developing this video game and we could fund them uh, even though they, they wouldn't be in a discipline that that sort of readily 
makes you think of digital tech, but I think we could probably work with that. So pretty, pretty flexible. Um, and as I said, either a Canadian citizen or a permanent resident uh, um, would be uh, would be required. And then if you uh, if you do happen to have someone that is is protected by the Immigration and, and Refugee Protection Act, then then they would also be uh, um, they would be certainly acceptable. But the key element here is that they do need to be registered in a Canadian public institution. Um, and that needs to be during the uh, duration of the work term. So another good example is if you have a college student that is in a one-year program, that might end, let's say, uh, they might graduate right after the work term, but as long as they're registered as a student during the work term, then, then that would be perfectly, perfectly fine. So that's pretty much all I wanted to say about the, the, the actual program and mechanics and so forth. And we we'll certainly uh, have some Q&A in just a, a few minutes here, but let me just talk a bit about the mechanics of, of um, the application process. So pretty much what will happen, and I've got some examples of what, the, what that application portal looks like in, in a moment, but uh, basically um, once you put in, uh, you enter your company information and, and student information and so forth, and that, that all gets approved, and we sign a contract, uh, then it is a work integrated learning program. So we have to have a learning plan, which typically takes 10 to 15 minutes just to sit down with the student and just surface what are those three areas that the student is gonna be learning and working in. Um, and that's done jointly with the student, make sure that everybody is on the same, the same page. Um, and then about halfway through the work term, then both the student and the employer would, would do a midterm check-in. And, and that is a very short uh, process. Um, I say five to 10 minutes here. I think you'd be hard pressed to, to spend more than five minutes on it. And if, uh, if time permits, we can take a look at uh, what that would look like, but it's really just a one, just a one page uh, questionnaire that effectively says, are, are you satisfied with, uh, with the work that's being done? And then the student has uh, something to do on their side as well, which really is just a confirmation that they're getting some, some good valuable experience out of that work term. And then similarly at the end, about two weeks probably before the end of the work term, then we just ask for that, um, that final, the final assessment. And again, it's about a 10 to, uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Um, and, and if you have any examples of, of the kind of project that the student worked on, any success stories, then you know we do ask to share, but that, that certainly isn't uh, required. And then, uh, as I said, typically we had required the uploading of payroll records at the end of the work term before we could forward any of the uh, the subsidy. But now uh, we're able to give a good portion, seventy five percent of that, right up front, uh, and then the balance of it is uh, is given uh, at the end after the payroll records have been submitted. So. You can find out more information about our program on at, um, whoops, oh darn, let me just go back here, here we go, um, at will.digital. You type that into your browser, that will take you to our landing page, and th this is what you'll see. Um, so this is our landing page, we have a little bit of information about the, uh, the program, there's um, an application guide you can download, and this is where you would click to, to apply now and that would take you to the sign-in page where you would set up an account. And as a business, you would enter your information just the one time, and then you can apply to have as many wage subsidies uh, for as many students as you're able to take on, um, which, uh, which is always a good thing. Um, so in terms of the, uh, the position description for each of the roles, we would just ask you to, uh, you, some of you may not be familiar with these these not codes. Um, that's a link to a, a broader set of them. And again, we just want to see something that is in an I, an IT or a digital tech kind of uh, arena. So uh, pretty flexible there. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we're looking to surface what are the three skills that that student is going to be acquiring during the course of the work term. That's what we're looking for. Um, so, as I said, in any, as within most grant applications, there's, there's certain ways that you need to present things and as long as, as, long as we're seeing things that are relevant uh, to digital tech in there, then, then that position is going, to be, uh, is going to be fundable. So, well, thanks everybody for your attention. That really 
brings me to the end of, of my portion of the uh, of the presentation. But just before we open up to general questions, and I have my colleague um, uh, Megan McLean from uh, the University of, of PEI. She's on on the uh, on the webinar as well to answer any questions that you may have that are relevant to uh, to some of the procedures and processes that uh, that she's familiar with. Um, these are some of the questions that that typically have come up uh, in the past. So I thought it would be good just to review these, and then if there, if hopefully this will answer some of your questions that have been uh, posed already, and then we can certainly open up the floor to any other questions that may come up. So absolutely, less than less than four months. We're not dealing with just co-op work terms here. We're dealing with pretty much any any work term um, that is. Uh, it doesn't even have to be part of the academic requirements, but it does have to have a learning component in it. There really isn't any minimum number of hours per week. Um, anything probably less than about 15 or 20 hours a week is probably not going to, to give that work integrated learning opportunity. But um, from our perspective, we're, we're willing to entertain whatever you can bring to the table. There is also this concept, if you recall back where we were talking about underrepresented students, we have a concept called newcomer. Um, and that would mean that they have a, a permanent residency card and the date on their card is less than five years from, to, from the start of the work term. So that's what a newcomer would be. And then we have had cases where the student decides for whatever reason that they are not gonna go back to school afterwards, even though they said they were, and that was one of the requirements, is that they're, you know, that, that they're planning on going back to, uh, to full-time or they're registered, um, they were registered for the work term, but then you know, something happens, they decide not to, not to be registered halfway through, and maybe they leave. And we're able to work with, um, with the employers and, and prorate the amount of the, uh, of the subsidy based on how long that, uh, that student was there. And you know, we saw a little bit of this flexibility uh, with the previous work term when COVID-19 happens all of a sudden and a lot of companies were just, they had to close down, shut off the work terms. Many of the work terms were not remote. They would have been you know, people in the office and that couldn't happen. And so we basically looked at how long did that student work on, on the work term and then we were able to base our subsidy um, just based on the actual hours that were and, and wage that was paid rather than waiting till the end of the, of the work term. Uh, no age limit, as we talked about earlier, I gave that example of, uh, of someone, but you know, it, it could be a PhD student that uh, has, goodness, they could have 20 years of, of experience under their belt. Um, so that, that's an interesting opportunity for folks that are looking for uh, perhaps some high-end talent. Um, and again, undergraduate students aren't necessarily, uh, it's not necessarily the first degree that they've taken, although it may well be. Uh, yes, not-for-profits are eligible. And I just want to spend just a minute on this uh, on this net new uh, concept because it is the goal of of the federal government and the goal of this program is to encourage companies who wouldn't normally take uh, on work term students encourage them to do just that. So that's where this net new concept came in. So basically, what we will do is that we would say so without any funding, how many students do you normally take on? If the answer is zero, then your baseline is zero. If the answer is, over the past five years, you've always taken on one student without will digital funding, so then your baseline will be one. And then from that point onwards, your baseline stays as it is. And then we would always be asking you each time you came around and applied for more uh, subsidies, we would like you to, um, if your baseline was zero, everything will be funded. If your baseline was one, then you'd have to take on that one student that you normally do plus additional ones in order to get funding for those additional ones. So that's where the, the net new concept comes in. And if you have any, if there's any questions about that, I'm happy to dig into it in a bit more detail, but we're certainly hoping for some flexibility um, in the next few days from our funder uh, around the, the net new components and also perhaps about how much that percentage is going to be. But uh, I think in the case of PEI with that very generous provincial subsidy, it probably isn't as much of an issue. So with, uh, with that said, thank you very much everybody for your time. I appreciate that. And I will definitely open the floor up for questions. Uh, Rachel, do we have any questions that came in? We don't have any questions in the chat so far, but if anyone wants to send any in now, or if you just want to ask one out loud, now's a good chance. 
see if anyone else has any before I get to anything. But thanks again, Tim. That's a really good summary of all this. Um, and I'll send the application link in the chat too, in case anyone had missed it. Um, but we'll see if anyone else has any questions. And then if not, I might be able to jump in with you. Um, I see Pat's up here too. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Pat. I just see, uh, yeah, Mike's asking if you'll forward the slide deck. Tim, I just had a question if you could speak to the, uh, the matching. And I, I sorry I came in late, and I know you're kind of speaking to that at the start, but if you had any details on that, and maybe even Mike could chime in there as well. So in terms of, of the way that the, the um, uh, I guess the, the term that, all, that everybody uses is called stacking, right? You stack one with another because the pro different provincial programs they they vary and the pei program is actually you folks are really lucky compared to what some of the other provinces are are doing so that's congratulations to your government um but basically what we would do as the federal po program we would like to put our money in on the table first so let's just say that you've got a seven a five thousand dollar subsidy that you can get from us so we would want to have the employer take the federal money first that helps the province because they may not have to come up with as much money because obviously you as as an employee as an employer you wouldn't well you might want to but you're not allowed to make money on this right so you can't take more money in than you're paying out in wages that, that's the goal so we would put ours on the table at five thousand dollars you would then uh work together with the provincial um uh, folks to make sure that whatever subsidy they're able to provide on top of ours does not exceed 100% of the of the salary. So, and, and I do have, um, I, I've reached out, I'm trying to reach out to all of the provincial uh, government organizations, it's, it's Skills PEI that are, that are administering this program. I have an email connection with those folks I, and I'm, I'm gonna speak with them as well, just to, you know, if there is interest and hopefully there will be some uptake in PEI to be able to, to leverage both of these programs, uh, then we'll, we'll just make sure that we, that we know how we're gonna make that, that, uh, that work. Awesome. Thanks, Tim. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Well, either I did an awesome job covering off everything that people could ever want to know about this, or everybody was asleep, or... No. <laughs> hi, Tim. It's Mike Gillis uh, from Innovation PEI. Hi. Yeah, I, I did a lot of work in the past with ICTC in a former life. Um, by the way, I, I'm not aware which program you're speaking of at the Skills PI. I'm, is it the job creation program that you mentioned once uh, that I heard? No, is that the provincial program that we're talking about there, Mike? Right, yeah. The one that I was referencing, and I've had a chat with, um, uh, with Skills PEI on this. Let me just mm -hmm. uh, look here. It is called the Post-Secondary Student po Program. Yeah, okay. So student work term funding is, is, is how, it's, uh, how it's couched there. And I do have the, uh, I did put the web um, in, in, my, uh, in my slide deck, the, uh, the link to the provincial site is, uh, is there as well. Okay, I'll go take a look at that. I actually joined the meeting a few minutes late because I was on another call, ah. but uh, I'm, I don't work for skills. Uh, um, I work for innovation, but we are sister organizations. I'll track it down and we'll figure it out for sure. And I'll push it out to our membership. Right, yeah, no, that's great. And I've been working with, uh, I think it's Steve, uh, Steve Thane, is it? Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. So he's aware of what's going on as well. Yeah, Steve and I chat regularly. Excellent, excellent, that's great. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it, would be, uh, it would be great for, uh, for companies to be able to take advantage of that. And, and as, as, I, as I understand it, it is, it is something that PEI would, uh, would allow pretty much any time I don't think this is just a COVID-19 uh, initiative, whereas right. in other places, in, in Nova Scotia, for example, uh, the provincial government in Nova Scotia specifically does not allow stacking, but yeah. this year they, they, are, they are certainly promoting as much as they can okay. just to open up some more opportunities. You yeah. mentioned, I think, in your presentation that they must be PI residents. Correct. That is what the uh, that's what your the website says. They need to be a residence of PEI. Okay. Um, the post secondary uh, employers is a new piece to the WIL. Yes, it is. It's a we we call them these COVID nineteen. Um, mm -hmm. uh, what are we calling them? 
COVID-19 accommodations or uh, flexibilities, but um, opening the, the funding stream up to post-secondaries is, is very new. Uh, it was okay. only announced about three weeks ago. And I think it's something that um, uh, it, it's being looked at by, so I'm, I've been working quite closely uh, with Dalhousie here, uh, and I know the University of Waterloo in Ontario are looking at becoming the employer and taking as much funding as they can from wherever they can get it, and then looking at finding opportunities either within the institution or out in the community uh, to, uh, to find some meaningful projects and some, I think some worthwhile projects that can add value, not just to the students, but also to the ecosystem of whatever community that they're in. Okay. And again, like any employer, they have to be net new positions. Correct. And we're, I, I don't want to, to say that we're, um, that we're expecting that to change, but we are expecting to hear some more flexibility coming up in the next uh, couple of days. And one of the areas that we're certainly hoping for is that at least for the summer, the net new is going to be waived. But that is not something okay. that has been formally announced at the moment. Well, I think that's all my questions for now. Thank you, Tim. And, and maybe I'll give you a call later and we can do a little chat offline. Yeah, absolutely. That would be great, Mike. Thank you. Okay. Mike's last question, too, sort of applies to <clears throat> what Lee has mentioned in the chat here. As if you can you retroactively apply for the subsidy if you've already hired students and been approved for the provincial program the PEI program yeah so if the if the student has already started then unfortunately there's that we, we can't do that the, the rules from the federal government don't allow us to if you've already hired the student but the student hasn't started the work term yet then go to our portal start an application it doesn't even have to be finished it just needs to be started and then we can assuming that everything gets approved and and i think it's highly likely that everything would be approved then you could qualify for that funding along with the provincial funding so the key there is get the application started before the beginning of the work term excellent that's amazing and how about what would you recommend if someone was on the fence they don't know if they should apply or not uh, yeah well i would say that um if someone said to you that you can earn five thousand dollars an hour for simply applying for a work term student i'd say that's a pretty good deal um, just kidding though you know but basically take i think your investment in time now there is going to be an investment in mentorship and that's that that's something that a, that a, a company you know particularly if you're um a, an early stage company that's something that we do need to be mindful of but i the reason that i that i went through that you know a couple of minutes up talking about um open ocean robotics is because that is a great example of a company that that took the plunge they brought in some talent and it took them the next level and basically allowed them to become a success story up in, in BC. And they couldn't have done it. They didn't have the financial resources to take on a consultant or to bring on an employee. Uh, and this was a great opportunity for them. So I would say if, if you've got a business out there that's on the fence, but they think that they might be able to, uh, they might be growing somewhere down the road, and may need to take on some talent, then what a great way at very low financial cost to really get to know a potential employee. And then, you, and you've also made a connection. And, and so when your business is, you know, back growing and you now need to take someone on, just as Open Ocean Robotics did, they took on, a, on a, a, an employee, they already knew that it was gonna be successful, right? Whereas if the way you, that you hire is by going through two or three one hour interviews or whatever that is, then you probably know how well someone interviews, but you don't know how well they're gonna work within your organization, unlike when you take on a work term student. So I say do it. And, and also just, you know, I mean, thinking altruistically, this is an opportunity for organizations to give back to the community as well, because you, know, you are creating an opportunity for a student to gain some, some valid work, work integrated learning skills that will, it likely will help you as an organization, 
but it definitely will help the student because it will make them more hireable when they finally graduate. And if they've had a positive experience in the local community, they're much more likely to want to stay in the local community. So, you know, I think it's a good way to try and build a connection and keep people, you know, keep people in PEI and don't have to go to, to Halifax or Toronto or Vancouver, right? Absolutely. Hi, Tim, I have a question for you. Hey, John. Um, thanks for, for this, by the way, it's, it's uh, been quite informative. My question is surrounding the parallels of relevancy between the existing program of study and the job position. So I have a candidate that's come to us who has applied for an information security role with our company. Um, background with IT as a, as a whole, went to Holland College for a computer networking degree and has since gone back to UPEI for a applied communications and leadership program and is currently in the works there. Looking for some summer work, has applicable experience, but the parallel with the current focus of study is uh, less so, um, I would say, parallel to, to the, the work that we're going to be doing here um, with the specific um, posting that, that they're right. applying to. So, I mean, we could probably get creative in drawing some of those parallels, but I just wanted to kind of circle back along those lines. You, I know you'd mentioned kind of the folklore as a, uh, yeah, a, a spec well, a specific it's a example. It's an example, but I think it's, a, it's illustrative of, of the flexibility that we have. But you raise a good point, Jordan, because earlier versions of the program going back three or four years, it was a co-op focused program and there needed to be the work integrated learning aspect needed to be consistent with what they, the academics were. Yeah. But as that program has evolved, it's not a requirement that there be an academic need for the work term. That, but there does need to be a work integrated learning uh, component to the work term. So to answer your specific question, if you have someone who either there is no formal work term in the program, they just want that they've got time over the summer and they want to add value to themselves and add value to your organization. That is a perfectly acceptable uh, opportunity. It doesn't have to match an academic program. Uh, if they are in an academic program, then the co-op funding might be, might, you know, there might be some requirements from the co-op program to make sure that there's a match. But from the ICTC perspective, we're more concerned about those digital tech learning opportunities that the student would, uh, would be exposed to. Yeah, so I, this is a, a first year student going between first and second. I don't think it's specifically a co-op term that they're looking for. Um, it was just, you know, looking for some summer work and uh, had yeah. previous experience within our sector. So. Yeah, no, that sounds like a really, really good fit. And what a great opportunity if you can combine it with, um, you know, with both provincial and, and our program, it would be a great fit. And of course, being a first year student, then that would qualify for the higher subsidy because they are one of the underrepresented groups that uh, that we see. Great, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Megan, I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to uh, to bring you to bring you into the conversation. No, that's that's no problem. We're we're always here. So if if there is uh, someone looking to connect with some students, absolutely reach out to the the call program at UPEI, and I can help you find someone that would would work for you. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you for that, Megan. Um, we have one more question in the chat oh. there now. Oh, oh sorry. fantastic. Are you? Did you just see it or? <laughs> no, no, I didn't look. Oh. Okay, no worries. Um, so Carrie Jones is wondering, um, do you maintain a list of students who are looking um, or can you connect with ways to find slash identify a potential student? That's a good question. And Megan may be able to touch on that a bit too from her perspective at UPEI. Yeah. Well, well, let me, um, I think, first of all, ICTC is not, a, we're not a matchmaker, right? So we don't identify students that would be a good fit and kind of make that connection. But what we are matchmakers in that we can connect you with with the local um, post-secondary institutions. So that's one of the reasons I brought Megan on um, really was really just to be able to address that kind of, of question because as I said earlier, even though we do have remote uh, work opportunities, if you're a PEI based company, I think it would make great sense to look, look within PEI first for the skills that you need. If you absolutely cannot find them, then with uh, remote wor remote work, then you know you can reach elsewhere in Atlantic if you need to. But um, Megan, did you want to maybe just talk a little bit about how an employ an employer 
would um, would engage with, say, University of PEI and and start looking for the right kind of talent? Sure. So yes, yeah, so Tim kind of brings the funding, and and I can bring the bodies. So uh, <laughs> we work back and forth with a variety of different wage subsidy programs, and and often it's an employer coming to us and saying, "I'd like to hire a student. I need some funding. Can you help me connect with a funder?" And, and so usually, depending on the sector that the the employer is working within and and the constraints, then we help them line up with a wage subsidy program after that. And then once they have that approved, um, and even and during that process, then we can work with them to help shape that job description of what type of student that they're looking for, the work that the student would be doing, and then reach out to the students within the co-op program um, who, you know, to seek their interest in applications from there. So we can certainly set up um, within our students uh, job posting and gain some applications that way. And then from there, the employer screens and interviews and selects if, if possible. Sometimes there's not a fit, but if there is a fit there, um, the employer has that choice to, to make that call on, on an offer. Great. Thanks, Megan. Hi, Megan. It's Mike. Hi, Mike. How are you doing? Good. Good. I was just wondering, I, I realize you would have um, a full profile of all the co-op students that might be available. What about students that are not in the co-op program? Is it are employers able to access those students? Would it be done through the chair of the particular department? How would that work? Yeah, so we I work within a broader unit around work integrated learning and, and within that is our career services team as well. So one of the best ways to connect with students outside of that is through career services. So they have a job posting board. Um, for those looking for grads, for those looking for current students, whatever you know situation you might be looking for, and they can post those job opportunities that way. Um, we have social media accounts that, that push out um, those jobs, not necessarily the individual job postings because that can get um, a little bit uh, overwhelming, um, but push out the opportunity for them to engage with that job board and search for opportunities that way. And uh, we also have our career fairs and that sort of thing as well, where employers can come to campus and connect with students. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions from anybody? Well, thank you again for, uh, for sharing your afternoon with us. I appreciate it. Rachel, thank you and Startup Zone for uh, inviting us to do this. It's been, uh, it's been my pleasure. And hopefully we were able to, to provide some good insights into uh, to what's out there and what can be done. And, uh, and if not this year, then hopefully the, uh, the next work term, you'll, uh, you'll at least know that, that there are some funding opportunities out there that can make it very cost effective to bring some students into your workplace. Awesome. Thanks again, Tim. Thanks everyone for coming out.